so in this next segment, we're going we're gonna to kind of, again, sort of this first part, we concentrated a lot on timing, use of androgen deprivation therapy, concentrating primarily, again, in, in what I fundamentally believe is the largest use of ADT, which is in the biochemically recurrent space, especially in the urology world. So as we, as we move forward now in the disease state, we, we all know, like I think, Jorge, you mentioned earlier, we know that despite ADT, a subsegment of these patients are going to pro progress to castration-resistant prostate cancer. We have spent a lot of time in previous episodes, in previous segments. You cannot pick up a journal article. You can't go online without seeing some new advance on newer therapies, molecular drivers in the metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer space. So, Dan, m moving to you for a second. So, you've got a very robust advanced prostate center. You do clinical research trials in a community practice, which I think is, is great. So, as you have these patients who are on ADT, especially the high-risk ones, when do you, as the director of the center, when do you start to encourage your partners to say, hey, listen, maybe we need to be a little bit more aggressive in trying to identify metastatic, dis metastatic disease? What are your triggers? Do you have triggers? Do you follow a guideline that helps the viewers to say, if I've got somebody on ADT and my PSA is starting to go up, when do I start imaging? That's a great question, Raul. Again, in, in my practice, I try to communicate to my partners um, that we, we tend to use the radar guidelines. And it's, it's a soft guideline, but it is, you know, a panel of experts that got together and looked at the data to determine when their risk of metastatic disease, when they were going to show up with metastatic disease. And, and again, it's basically to start imaging when that first PSA hits two, uh, start with a bone scan and a CAT scan. Um, again, if you find that they still have M0 disease in our, in our group, we'd put them on a clinical trial, uh, avoid Casadex. Uh, but then again, the next, next monitoring would be, and we try, tend to keep a lot closer eye on these folks. Maybe it's an every two month PSA testosterone, might be every three months. But then if they, when that first doubling time, I use four and think the radar criteria is five, then we would probably image them again. If they have a really rapid doubling time and I had a very high index of suspicion that I'm missing a met with the older technology in San Antonio, I would probably get a sodium fluoride PET CT and then I would uh, do it on, on every other doubling time. But again, some of the, I mean, again, at least in, we're in my community, it's a little bit challenging to get that sodium fluoride PET as far as documentation, uh, getting a, a, a specific radiologist that you trust to interpret the data, those kind of things. Alicia, is that sort of what the Vanderbilt Advanced Clinic does? I would say we do the same thing, um, and I would echo the, the, the challenges with getting some of those advanced imaging techniques, um, and, and we're lucky that we do have partners in the community who are able to get those, and, and others in the community who have tested these radiologists time and time again with many scans, because I do think it's something that they need experience with because they can be so sensitive. We, we really need to know when they're truly positive and, and not find false positives in these patients. But I would say we do, we do just the same thing. So just one thing for the you know for the future and for the way payers are going to look at these scans, I think that if we look at other malignancies and how PET was used, there was a big discouraging of serial molecular imaging. I think part of that was due to cost, much more than dose or anything like this. And so that's going to plague us as well. Some of these some of these newer um, modalities, once you know where the lesion is on your sodium fluoride PET, you can have your radiologist go back and really find it on conventional imaging. And so if we do start using them, I think that one of the practice patterns we'll see is sort of a baseline at time of, you know, concern that there is actually disease present, and then the follow-up will be with conventional imaging. You know, I, I agree with that, but, but I do have some concerns actually with that because if, if you look at that, it's precisely the reason why within the PCWG3 we move away from uh, emerging technologies, right? And, and, and within the consensus of the guideline, uh, specifically a guideline for research studies, right? Uh, we continue using conventional technician 99 bone scans and CTs of the chest, abdomen, and pelvic region. 
So for those, practically, for those patients, for those physicians who do not use ADT for rising PSA syndrome, M0 is not a disease that exists for them. Right. For all of us, if we use ADT for rising PSA, we may capture a subset of those patients who may have actually uh, uh, M0 CRPC. I, I tell my patients, and I just try to be quite practical about this, that at the end of the day, I don't, I don't chase numbers, right? So I tell them your quality of life, your symptoms or lack thereof from your disease, what kind of side effects I'm gonna induce if I'm gonna have to put you on treatment that can cause detriment to your quality of life, what your scans are telling me, and what is your PSA, absolute value, and doubling time. I use those features in that sequence and in that order to make my treatment choices. I only scan patients when I'm gonna do something uh, treatment-wise. I don't scan people just to scan people. Now, if you were to do a scan baseline, right, one of the challenges is if you have a patient in a trial and you get a PET fluoride or a PET choline or a PSMA PET, you cannot revert back. And that's a challenge that you and I may experience. You know, even at the clinic, it's very hard to get a, a PET approved, a sodium fluoride PET. You have to be over 65 or you have to be part of the PET registry program, right? So, and it's challenging because if you do a technician 99 and it's negative and you come back with a fluoride PET, what are you gonna do? You cannot go back and do a, sodium, a, 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 a technician 99 again because you're gonna have no disease that you're gonna see. And yet again, another challenge, we continue debating timing for treatment. Does timing really matters, right? Now, I have changed my practice because if you look at the European data, at least retrospective in nature, the outcome of patients with one or more bone lesions at five years, less than 3% of those men are, are alive, right? So that's huge. So to some extent, I do wanna recognize and identify early metastasis because I think we can treat those patients with life prolonging treatments, but the timing is really not well defined and that's one of the challenges that we face. Right, I, I mean, I think, I think as we, with all the new agents that have been approved since 2010, I think there's no question that all of us believe that earlier identification, which was the whole, which was the whole basis of the radar working group, and as Dan, as you mentioned, this was a consortium of academic and community medical oncologists, urologists, and radiation oncologists that sort of came up with what made sense because the guidelines don't really give us that. AUA, NCCN, uh, ASCO, they don't really tell us when to start imaging. But I would. So what's frustrating, as as you said, and all of us do trials, is that we got all these cool scans but all the trials continue to be based upon traditional technetium nuclear medicine bone scan and CT. And again, I think that this is going to be, I think, a challenge for all of us. I think all of us would agree that we would love to have some of these agents earlier on. I think the, uh, the concept we know that <clears throat> M0, the true M0 patient, it's clinical trial or observation. We know all the data that if they truly are negative on bone scan CT, that within two years, 46% develop a radiographic uh, bony met. Um, I think all of us sort of want to believe that if we could impact the disease with lower PSA levels, that it makes intuitive sense that they should do better. And I think that's why we're starting to see a lot of these now trials in M0 because I think everybody is wanting, as you said, Ash, to get these, to get these drugs earlier in the disease state. So.